Welcome to another edition of Behind the Glass. Mikey McNuggets, Earl the Pearl, up, and boss? Anthony Antonelli is truly behind the glass this morning, producing, directing, all by himself back there. A man of many talents. Low key. Yes, he is. A man of many talents. Some of them go unknown to he, the fans out there. He showed me uh, one of his uh, spreadsheets, you know, for the work that he does outside of here. Here it is. I'm thinking this man got the balance. We don't. He don't. It's just that it's, it's in a different area. Yeah, he has just different interests outside of sports. Yeah. He's not a crazy fanatic, frankly, like yeah. a lot of us are. And Anthony, in a way, I'm, I feel bad for you in a way, but I'm also extremely jealous that you don't feel the same pain anytime something goes wrong that a lot of us do. He don't be stressed. I f- oh, wait, no. Hold on. I feel like you guys misunderstand. I gave up sports, like being a fan. <laughs> After too much, 20, too much pain. After 2016, when the Cavs won it, I couldn't do it anymore. I, that that series took years off my life. But it ended happily. Yeah, it was still happy, but that got to end it on a high note. Like I, it took. So you walked off into the sunset. Yes, that is exactly what I did with my sports fandom. I was like, <laughs> I'm like not Manny following it this close anymore. Hey, well, like Earl it. said, he's got the a much better, happier work life balance than you and I do. So whatever you're doing, kudos to you. Um, even if you've given up the greatest pleasure in, in life, which is watching Facts. your team win. So, Facts. All right, Earl, a couple things you wanted to hit on this morning. First off, Jimmy Haslam said the two options they're exploring for a new stadium are a renovated downtown stadium or a dome stadium, most likely in Brook Park, but we know it won't be downtown. Right. If there's a dome, it will not be in downtown Cleveland. And Earl came in and said... I got a third plan that I think is better than both of those that may piss some people off, but in the long run will be the best outcome for the city. So, Earl, what do you think? Well, let's let's start with what we know first, right? It's two plans in in place right now. The first one is a million dollar renovation plan for the billion, one billion dollar renovation plan for the current stadium that we have, and the other one is to you know build a dome outside of downtown Cleveland. We presume that would be in Brook Park. That would cost twice as much, if not more, than what the renovations would, would be. And when I first heard this, the first thing I thought about, it doesn't make sense to renovate that's the current stadium for a billion dollars to where eventually you're going to have to just end up building a new stadium anyway. And currently, there is no other location to build a stadium downtown Cleveland. And I don't see a location coming available in the near future. Fact. Now, there could be some ideas. We're right here on Lakeside, you know, right to the, to the left of us is the FBI building. Then there's a lot of free land on that side that could be an option. Highly doubted, but just throwing something out there. I think that a lot of people will be highly pissed off if this thing was to leave downtown Cleveland. I can understand Brook Park, like to me, it makes sense, you know, especially if you're going to build a dome. You have more connecting highways to get fans in and out of the city faster. So, you know, it's some, it's some positives there. But when I thought about it this morning, the conclusion I came to, I think the best course of action that will ultimately please everybody is to find a neutral site for the Cleveland Browns to play for maybe the next two seasons, tear down the current Cleveland Browns stadium, and rebuild a dome stadium on the land that the current stadium sits on. I think, honestly... That's where both sides can meet at in the middle. You get your dome stadium, you still get to keep it downtown. You just have to find somewhere to play for the foreseeable future. And I think when people talk about, you know, the economical impact, the emotional impact that the Cleveland Browns leaving downtown Cleveland will have, this is how you can nip all that in the bud. But like I told you before, I do think it's a situation to where both parties need to come to the table, you know, find some common ground, and in order for the taxpayers of Cleveland to front any of this bill, we need some incentives on the back end. Yeah. We need to see some like l- true dedication to resources and funds uh, into the city of Cleveland to help grow this city even more. In a perfect world, I like the stadium downtown. Mm-hmm. As a non-Clevelander moved here two and a half years ago now, part of what makes the city awesome is all three sports are right in the center of downtown. Mm-hmm. And on game days in Cleveland, on Sundays, Starting in the flats to the end of the damn muni lot, which is what, East 30 something? Mm-hmm. It's an unbelievable atmosphere. It's irreplicable. It reminds me of a college tailgate scene, going back to my days working in the SEC, where the entire town is dedicated to one common cause on Saturdays, here at Sundays, but nothing else matters. 
I'm not saying it's the heartbeat of downtown, but it feels right being downtown. Mm -hmm. And I understand there's eight, nine games a year for football as opposed to 81 for baseball and 41 for basketball. And they still have those events throughout the year. But let's not pretend a pregame Cavs game or a pregame for a Guardians game is one-tenth, one-fifteenth, one-twentieth of the pregame a Browns game is. Is that, is that a fair assessment? Yeah, that's, that's fair. So, you know, I understand all the reasonings to why you'd want to move from downtown to Brook Park. I get in a theoretical vacuum the advantages of the Dome, the advantages of having all the housing developments, bars, restaurants, building that area in Brook Park into a essentially a separate Cleveland Browns town. I'm just saying, personally, I think Cleveland as a city and the Browns as an organization are better downtown. With that being said, I don't think renova- renovating the current stadium downtown makes a lot of sense mm-hmm. because it's just patchwork. At the end of the day, you can renovate it. There's still no dome, and what, we're going to have to do this again in 10 years? Right. And that's just going to be a continuous cycle, and renovations eventually cost more than just building a new one in the long term. So I think all signs are pointing to this becoming the de facto Brook Park Browns. My only pushback on your plan, can it be done in two years? I think fans could, could, could digest, okay, we're going to get a dome stadium downtown. They're going to be pissed off, obviously. Right. But I think two years, they could probably understand. If it's a four- or five-year project, and I have no idea how long that would take because now you're adding demolition, clearance, and all that to the, the timeline, would you do it if it was a three- or four-year plan? I think the two years is just a number that, uh, that, 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 that came saying. to my two, mind. But if it's two years, for sure, if it's longer. I, I think even if it was longer, I think Browns fans will be okay with it as long as the end result is the stadium remains downtown Cleveland. Like, I think that it's got to be some give and take. Yeah. If we truly want the stadium to remain downtown Cleveland and the only way for that to be done is to tear down the stadium that's currently there and rebuild on that same land, the only way that the Clevelanders are going to get that wish is if the Browns find somewhere else to play at for a few seasons. Yeah. And if it works out in that way, I mean, hell, Minnesota did it. It seemed like Minnesota played what they played at the University of Minnesota for like a year or two and they found somewhere else to play. Yeah, now Minneapolis is the University of Minnesota, I believe, is in right outside Minneapolis. Yeah, but I'm, I'm just saying, like but they play, I think a year. Or two th- there's years an example that. of teams yeah. who've played outside. I think of, the Jaguars did that too. It's a few teams that's done it before, and I, I just think that's what makes the most sense. You know, when all this came out yesterday, I think we have to understand that this is just the first of of many discussions that's going to go on. You know, my take comes from an emotional standpoint based on being from the inner city and understanding what I see when I'm out here in these streets, mm-hmm. right? But there's a business side of everything. And I think uh, Mayor Bibb's approach to this is unique, but he's unique. He's a yeah. young mayor, right? And so people can't expect him to approach these situations traditionally how people would in the past. You know what I mean? And I respect that about him. Right now, it seems like he's standing his ground. How long will that last? We don't know. But the truth of the matter is, I'm asking Jimmy Haslam to do something that no other NFL owner does. And that's front the whole bill for a stadium. The chances of that happen, happening is highly unlikely. Only one. Only Kroenke in, uh, in LA. Right. The only one who's ever done so it. So it's like, yeah, it's wishful thinking, but to me, he would do himself a, 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 a he would, he would, he would gain a whole lot of love yeah. if he was to do that, you know, but yeah. I just think that that's the way that we can meet in the middle and, and figure this thing out is to tear down the current stadium, rebuild on that same land. And there you have it. You got a dome downtown Cleveland. And what do you think? I think it needs to stay downtown, but I also understand the patchwork argument that you were making, Mike. Yeah. I grew up with everything downtown like it's never not been downtown for me Uh, everything's right there you can take the tram down to tower city and walk anywhere and see all three teams it would feel really weird not to have them down there but i think you have to be realistic and if we get a dome out of it i think it's worth moving it out i like everything else that comes with a dome i think outweighs the cons of it being not in downtown yeah i'm with earl in the sense that in a best case scenario i think that's the best case outcome you Get a dome, which I think at the end of the day, if you're prioritizing things, 
Is getting a dome the number one priority out of all of this, regardless of location? Is a dome the number one priority, or to you, is it staying downtown? <laughs> Man, that's a really, really good question. Honestly, I think it depends. For me personally, I think having a dome is the number one priority. I do. I think that fans don't want to sit out in the cold, right? We could talk all that, you know, we tough and this is what football is like, but I had season tickets before. And I've sat down there when the wind is swirling and the rain is going crazy and the snow is blowing from every direction. It's not a, it's not a comfortable environment. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't care what the Browns are doing. You're not yeah. really enjoying yourself the way that you want to. And so I think it just creates for a better fan atmosphere. And not only that, man, even like with the new rule changes that was talked about earlier on the show today, like everything is geared towards offense. And so if you want to see your stars put in the best situation, you want to you want to see everybody, you know, show what they got, then this is the way that you do it. And then when you take away everything from the football standpoint, the concerts, the possible Super Bowl, right, the the NCAA men's tournament possibly one day. There's so many different things that can come where having a dome, yeah. it, it's, it's, man, listen, it's just, they're going to have to figure this out. I think a dome is my number one priority too, which is why my gut tells me no matter how much I want it to stay downtown, Brook Park is the move, just based on what we've seen and the money situation. I, I think at the end of the day, just renovating downtown makes no sense. Just, just currently renovating the, uh, the stadium as is downtown mm -hmm. is just delaying the actual conversation by 10 years. Yeah. And in 2034... Whoever's sitting in these UCSS chairs, hopefully it's us. And Jay retired or is about to retire, and, and Bull is weighing 223 pounds. He's lost 150 pounds from his weight loss. And G. Bush just had his 43rd surgery, but he's still kicking it. And Earl, your <laughs> hair's down to your ankles. And you, you know what I'm saying? Like, we're going to have this exact same conversation in 10 years if it's just patchwork. Right. Like, no matter, no matter how you want to do it, you could put, what's it saying? Put lipstick on a pig, but at the end of the day, it's still pig. Stadium downtown needs a lot of work. Yeah, and I don't does. think people understand necessarily how much worse the facilities are in downtown Cleveland right now compared to some of these new facilities they've built across the league. And to get it up to those standards, and we just saw in the player survey a couple weeks ago, facilities do matter. Yeah, they do. Like, it's something that these players do care about. And granted, Cleveland's fans make up for a lot of it. The passion and love the city gives the players makes up for a lot of it. But when you see some of the stadiums that – the Vikings or the Falcons or these new teams, the Bills' new stadium in 2028 that opens up, SoFi in L.A. It's here, and then right now what the Browns are at is here. And even renovations, you may get close to that, but it's, once again, it's renovations. You fix a flat tire in a car, Earl. We've had car issues, both of us. Yeah. It seems like as soon as one thing happens, even when you get it fixed, something else happens. Something else and happens. next thing you know, you're, down, you're out $1,400 trying to fix four of the things. So I like your idea. I, if it's a two-year plan and you can get it done in two, I'm all in. Two probably a stretch. If it's three or four, I think you're going to have to have a hell of a sales pitch to Cleveland fans to make the wait worth it. Even though if I was one, you know, me personally, I'd wait. Because a dome downtown, I think, is worth any kind of wait. Because sure. at the end of the day, that is the best possible outcome to this scenario. So I would wait. I'm not sure if I have the same mindset as a lot of other people who are maybe a little older and don't want to wait, if that makes sense. I can understand that, too. I can understand the older fans might be looking around saying, you know what, I might not even be alive when that new stadium is finished to see my team play. I just think that, you know, a lot of conversations will be had. They have to be had. And the people of, uh, of Cleveland matter. Their voices do matter. And I know for a fact that nobody really in their heart wants to see mm -hmm. this, this stadium leave downtown Cleveland. But if you truly want a dome, like, it, right now, at least, it sounds like that's the only way for it to happen. But I think that was the first of many public, you know, tea leaves that we will get behind this. The city has still not said much. You know, Mayor Bibb took his stance, and that's what it's been since then. You know, but I, I think that conversations will be had, and something will get figured out. Because truthfully, I really don't think Jimmy Haslam wants to leave downtown Cleveland. That's just my gut instinct. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think he'd be fine leaving if the city fronts the other half of the dome and then he gets all the benefits of having an entire complex that's paying him. But we will see. Speaking of Haslam, 
He also said on Monday that Kevin Stefanski and Andrew Berry are close, and I'm using the word close because that was his exact words, close to getting long-term extensions. My personal belief is this should happen months ago, <laughs> but better late than never. And I'm still, you know, I still need to see pen to paper before it's official, but better late than never is better than it not happening. Earl, we have not gotten the details out on any extensions. What do you think the extension for Stefanski and Barry should look like, assuming close means it's a done deal? Did he say long term? He said long term extension, yeah. Oh, long term, okay. Well, now long term in football, you know, <laughs> it's the not for long league. That could literally mean one more year for I mean I'm just, I like, mean who knows, it, yeah, but I, what do you think the extension when I when I like? when I hear long term I, I think of a four year deal yeah. that's the first thing that comes to my mind but at minimum the extension should be whatever the duration of Deshaun Watson's contract is so two more years after this season. right I think that both Kevin Stefanski and Andrew Berry has earned a right to see this entire project through and I think that if this project is hugely successful and he came back and he had both of those dudes four or five year extensions, I think nobody in this city will, will have an issue with that. And then on the flip side is if Deshaun Watson never turns into the player that we thought he would be, if this whole trade, this whole uh, uh, experiment don't work out and Jimmy Haslam decided to move on from Kevin Stefanski and Andrew Berry, I don't think fans will have a problem with that either. So I think at minimum two years, I think it's enough to show, show the city and the fan base, they like, look, I'm not the same old Jimmy. I didn't fire anybody. I didn't run anybody out of town. I awarded people for their hard work. Kevin Stefanski being a two-time coach of the year. Andrew Berry being a respected general manager. You know, at the end of the day, I think their future will be tied to Deshaun Watson. And so at minimum, you get the rest of his duration of his contract with this team to see what it's about. And if it works out, then it's great for everybody. He's getting an extension. Yeah. <laughs> Barry's getting an extension. Yeah. Stefanski's getting another extension. So, yeah, I don't. I don't mind that. I, I didn't think necessarily in terms of exact years. I just know those two are two of your three pillars of this foundation right mm -hmm. now. Barry, Stefanski, and Deshaun Watson. Those are your three pillars. And we've seen Andrew Barry go out and acquire Deshaun Watson in the first place. We've seen Andrew Barry work magic on the fringes. He got Zadarius Smith. Amari Cooper and Jerry Judy for four fifth-round draft picks and a sixth-round draft pick. His draft record, solid, not great. I think we all agree he's had some hits, he's had some misses, but so has every GM. He hasn't had that elite home run AA-plus draft yet. He's had certain picks that have hit home runs, but his classes. And I think he's done a really good job in free agency. So him, what more can you ask for from a GM? Stefanski's a two-time coach of the year in four years. He won 11 games last season despite starting five different quarterbacks. I think as we get further and further removed from the end of the season, we have forgotten just how crazy it is that DTR beat the Steelers, a 10-win team. P.J. Walker beat the 49ers and the Colts, two teams that A, was the one seed in the AF, uh, NFC, made the Super Bowl. Another team in the AFC that fought and fought to the end to make the playoffs. Deshaun Watson won games, and then Joe Flacco did what he did, that magical run. Uh, lightning in a bottle, whether it was Flacco just being outrageously hot, whether it was him and Stefanski clicking, who the hell knows, who the hell cares. Right. They won four games. You go back and you look at that body of work, and in four years, he's now done it with Baker. He's now done it with Jacoby. The quarterback he hasn't done it yet with is Deshaun, who you hope in the next three years. That flourishes into That's the, one that matters. the same kind of success that you've seen, and that is, to your point, the only one that really matters at the end of the day now. So I don't know why you would not extend them, not extend them earlier. My whole thing was they should have been a priority. That, that's why I was frustrated it hadn't happened yet. In my mm -hmm. mind, those two were priority moves to keep two of your three pillars of the organization in place. Once again, better late than never. I'm still waiting for the ink to dry, but I'm glad it's happening. I think they both are more than deserving of it. And lastly, with Stefanski and Barry, as long as you have those two, They've shown that despite all the moving pieces, they can put a competitive team on the football field, right? We've gone through, what, seven quarterbacks? A Nick Chubb de a dehabilitating injury last season. A defense that with Joe Woods was not good. A defense with Jim Schwartz that was fantastic. What haven't those two guys overcome in the last four years to make you think that they're the issue and something else isn't? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. 
Yeah. So I'm I, happy. It's, it's, it should be a happy day in Cleveland. I, I think that, just my opinion, I think Jimmy might have been a little emotional, a little pissed off after, after how we lost in the playoffs. And, you know, I respect him for not kind of, you know, moving too quickly one way or another, kind of letting himself calm down and, and, and let facts ride over feelings. And I think that he probably wanted to look back and say, okay, I know what I got in these two, and I've seen what they've done in previous off seasons to improve their staff and their roster. Before I go out here and put P in the pa- paper and ink these dudes up for an extension, let me just see what improvements that they make now. Because yeah, this season, this season was magical. Like th- to that's the word I will use. The season was magical. It makes no sense. They it, led it makes absolutely no four sense at all. quarterbacks and they led the league and, in and turnovers the, and they won eleven games. The Browns had Doesn't, every the, the Browns had every excuse to win three or four games this year, and that would have been that. And we could have argued to the point to where everybody that mattered was hurt, but that wasn't the case. And so even with that being the case, I think to see both of them go out there and make mass improvements, especially to the staff, mm-hmm. like that's where it matters the most to me. And so that's where you see most of Kevin Stefanski's growth in particular. And I think that Kevin Stefanski is a, a free-spirited dude. I don't think he's a guy that has that much of an ego to where like he wants to have a stranglehold on everything. You just see him growing yeah. as, a, as a coach every single year. He's the kind of person you want to invest in. Truthfully, and like I think that he's one of those dudes. I hope that he's one of those dudes that the Cleveland Browns coach for many years. I want the same type of longevity out of him that we see in Baltimore with Harbaugh, that we see in Pittsburgh with Tomlin, that we see in Kansas City with Reed. Like I want that. And continuity matters. It it does absolutely. And not just from a coaching standpoint, but the continuity between a coach and a front office. Now, you can have over continuity, Mm -hmm. and eventually your voice kind of wears thin, and you don't get the same reaction and, and. resonation in the locker room that you did when you first started but look at the successful teams in the nfl like yes you can change coaches doug peterson comes in for andy reed they win a super bowl in two years it happens there right. there are instances where you inherit a great team a new voice reinvigorates everybody and and you can blossom and take off but for the most part the best teams in football when you have a good coach you don't do anything to screw that up no right no like, Sean McVay's got two extensions already. Yeah. Shanahan's got extended. Yeah. Andy Reid's been in uh, Kansas City for a decade now, right, if I'm, not, if I'm correct. Belichick was there for 20-something years. Like, continuity is a good thing. They might have not a won a Super thing. Bowl, but the sustained success in Pittsburgh is crazy. Like, yeah. winning they, the Super Bowl they, they have is won a Super Bowl. I, I, they, not, not forever, not, but yeah. It's been a while is what yeah. I'm saying, but I guess what – like – to sustain that level of winning when parity is a real thing in the NFL, man, that's tough to do. Yeah. That's really, really tough to do. And it's not like they always have rosters that really is the up there. Quarterback sucks and spin. Yeah, but sucked. when you got Mike Tomlin, when you got that continuity, when that foundation has been in place for so long, I think you can withstand roster turnovers like yeah. that. You can withstand those few years to where your team might not be as competitive on paper as you used to it as being. And I think that Kevin Stefanski has shown in different scenarios that he can make sure he put a competitive football team on the field. This is a dude who took this job during COVID, yeah. right? And that says a lot about who he is, the fact that he was able to galvanize the troops and able to put together a team that was able to go to a playoffs during one of the most difficult times in this country, where you would assume teams that had the stability in place yeah. you know, would have had more success than the Cleveland Browns did. You look at what he did this past season. You look at what he did last year when you expected Deshaun Watson to just be gone for six games. It turns into 11, and the Browns were still competitive all year long. The season didn't end like we wanted, but outside of two games maybe, we were right there, could have won or lost those games. So he's continued to prove who he is. At the end of the day, the way I look at this is, over the last two seasons, and I'm going to speak in the last two specifically because that's since I've been here mm-hmm. day-to-day in, in, in the trenches. The Browns have been a wave. Six games, 11 games. Deshaun's back. It hasn't looked great. Injured. P.J. Walker. Jacoby Brissett. And they've been a pretty steady force. And you know why? One man. Or really two. Barry giving him a roster to sustain the up and downs. And Stefanski. Yeah. Being the steadying force in the middle to allow this franchise to succeed despite the constant change around him. Yeah. And when your pillar's there, it's like, 
I'm not saying Kevin Stefanski is LeBron James. I'm, I'm just going to use this comparison. <laughs> I could probably use a better one, but LeBron won with a thousand different rosters, right? Yeah. It didn't matter who the hell was around LeBron because. Man, did you see the team he that he took LeBron. to the finals in 2007? Yeah, it's a joke. Like, that was one of the worst. <laughs> it's the worst finals roster of all time, bar none, not even close if you take LeBron off it. They didn't have another good player, essentially. Like, like, like Drew Gooden was your starting power it, forward. It, it, incredible. Stefanski's not LeBron. LeBron is the best or second best, depending on how you want to look at a basketball player in the history of the world. Stefanski's not a top two coach in the NFL today. I'm not saying he's LeBron. My point is, when you have a guy who can sustain that much change around him, it doesn't really matter who's around him as long as you have that guy. I think through four seasons, Stefanski has shown he can be the pillar around constant change and still replicate success and still give you results that may not be exactly what you want. It hasn't resulted in a Super Bowl yet, but can get you as damn close as anyone could drag that collection of talent based on what he has at the, at the time and, and what's available in the moment. You can't control injuries. You can't control quarterback situations. And obviously, if it was up to him, Deshaun would play 17 games. You can't control the team's effort, the team's preparedness, the team's willingness to essentially die for you, and late game situations. And yeah, the one in Seattle, whatever, we can argue, we go back and forth on, should he have ran it, should he have thrown it, whatever, P.J. Walker, he should have ran the ball. <laughs> However, I think he's passed most of those tests with flying colors. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think when it comes to both of these dudes, you know, sometimes we put the microscope on what they don't do well t- all too far often, when in reality with both of them, I think that the good clearly outweighs the bad. You know, sometimes we're emotional. We're an emotional fan base. We're an emotional city. And sometimes, man, we can target in on things that we feel like are Achilles heels too much, not realizing like everybody got flaws. Everybody have things that they, they don't do well. But overall, I think you got two solid men. That's a, a, a core piece of what this Cleveland Browns organization has become, yeah. especially from a culture standpoint. And we got four minutes before we wrap up here. Let's talk about something fun for a sec. Who is Kevin Stefanski's Pokemon comp? Putting you on the spot again. Why do you always do this? Um, because we have three minutes left. I'm just trying to kill some time. A Pokemon here. comparison for him? Yeah. I don't know. He's probably Pikachu because he's always there. Uh-uh. All reliable? Yeah, just all reliable. Like, I, w- I trust Kevin Stefanski to get this organization to a Super Bowl. Genuinely. Like, I'm really excited about the extension news. I know when we brought Vrabel in, I went on record and I was like, all right, this tells me he's done. If anything goes wrong, I'm glad I'm wrong about that. I'm very happy that I'm wrong about that. Uh, I think moving on from Stefanski would have been a terrible idea. All right, next question. Hit me with it. Jay, the day after he got arm surgery, Bull and G. Bush locked in the weight room. Only one could enter. One could leave alive. Who's leaving alive? Jay has one arm of mine. Like, he just literally had UCL surgery yesterday. Jay, Bull, Bull G, only one could leave alive. Bull's taking out. them both out. Let's be honest. Bull's a New York fighter. <laughs> Like, no questions asked. I'm going, with, I'm going with Jay. Even with one arm? Even with one arm. Man, Jay work out every day. Jay even, actually, Jay's even, in phenomenal shape. Yeah. Like, even with one arm. So, I'm going with Jay. Jay in the, most, uh, he, he in the best shape. He's by far in the best shape. G. Bush is by far the biggest. It does worry me that every step G takes, like, his knee just may crumble. <laughs> like, I love G, but, like, that man's holding on by a thread. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, like G... G got up to go to the bathroom during the show yesterday, and he did like a little hop over the cable, and I was like, oh my goodness, great. G, like, G is like see. our, he's like our Udonis Haslam, man. <laughs> That's what yeah, well, G, you know what I'm talking about yesterday? Yeah. Well, you, were, you were on the set yesterday. G took a little hop over the cable where the, the camera cords are running, <laughs> and like, it's like a, what, an inch and a half? Oh, you can see it right there, what, inch and a half off the ground? Yeah, well, I, was, I was legitimately worried that I was going to buckle a knee or, or do something to have G fall. And next thing you know, he's going to hit the table, flip the printer. Someone's laptop was going to go flying. Like, I know, real. You got to walk behind the cameras, man. <laughs> well, he walked behind you yesterday coming back in. I was like, gee, go around that way. Yeah, yeah. I thought Gee was going to trip on that cable yesterday and break his knees. That's or his crazy. shoulders or his elbows or, That's or whatever. That's crazy. Hey, I heard, well, I seen it on Instagram. I think Rush Hour 4 is an amazing. Is it? Yeah. What's, what's a movie they made one too many of? Right oh, now, it's looking like. Furious. Huh? All the Fast and Furious. All the fa- <laughs> I love them. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But there's way too many. Wasn't of them. the most recent one? Wasn't it like The Rock? Uh, 
That's um, the that's the right the, way. The, the, the Rock's in a bunch of but and it like ten so of they, them. Now? They signed on for ten movies and they should have ended it after seven. Ten. How many are they at now? They just they just I finished think nine. At ten. Yeah, the Paul, this listen, the be... Paul Walker one should have been the last. I was gonna say once Paul Walker they, died, they were under yeah. contract. Yeah. They couldn't do it. Yeah, they like once Paul Walker three. like 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 passed away. Uh, both said the day. I've never seen Kung Fu Panda, but both said the fourth one they're just added Kung Fu Panda stuff to me. Despicable Me should have been a one time movie. Didn't need the second ones. Y'all just gave uh, me an idea. What? I want to do a podcast with y'all, and I want to rank y'all top five hood movies of all time. Excuse top me? Top five hood <laughs> movies of all time. Ooh. Uh, let me just give you the top. Let me think, let me think right now. Clip this. <laughs> that was the question, right? Your top five hood movies of all time. I think I missed. <laughs> I don't want to say. I, I don't want to say something and be like, that doesn't count. All right, let me th- let me think on this. We'll get back yeah, to this next next week on behind the glass. I we'll, honestly don't know. We'll do a top five hood. Movies. I, mean, I guess you better go Google hood movies. No, I, and, and you better that's 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 what you need to be watching for the rest of the week. <laughs> so I was just going through my letterbox account last night. I don't know if I have many in there that would count for this category. Yeah, I'm scared to say something that early to be like that's not hood enough. <laughs> just give me an example. I, look, Mike. Whatever you do, just don't say a Tyler Perry movie. No, 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 no. Come on now, come on. Like American Gangster. Okay. I wouldn't put that in miles, but American Gangster, it, it can classify. That was a good, a good ass movie. Yeah. Oh, I got a fun, I got a fun story for you guys, real quick. I'll oh, tell a story. We'll wrap and then. <laughs> yeah, and then I was we'll on get TikTok back. yesterday, and there's a podcast. I'll have to look it up, but he interviews people who went to prison. He he served time in prison. The host, right? I can't think of his name, but he talked about how they would get contraband phones in to mm-hmm. watch Power. And, like, everybody would get together at, like, 7 a.m. on a Saturday morning to watch Power on, like, a Samsung Galaxy broken phone. And I just thought of Earl because I'm like, I know you love that show so don't much. Don't spoil it. I, I don't know anything about it, but. A little tease. Yo, Ghost is a, Ghost is a badass. A little tease. On the first, the first week of April, the Ultimate 216 show, it might have everybody's favorite lawyer on there. Got a text a couple days ago. Nice. Yeah, so we'll leave it at that. Nice. So, but yeah, that's our homework. I need to know your top five hood movies this of is, all this time. This is going to be some homework then. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm just, I'm scared to say something that right now. You like, for example, I got Paid in Full in mind. Paid, see, I'm not familiar with that one. Oh, you got to go watch Paid in yeah, Full. Yeah, I don't know that one. You know, know you from that New York, New Jersey area. <laughs> you got to watch Paid in Full. I'll throw myself to the fire. Does Coach Carter count? No. 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 Okay. I don't that's, know. That, clip, it, clip it. Clip it. That's what I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, like, clip like, it. I, I, I gotta run well, this by like, Earl and make sure these some, count. I need like some category. Like I need to know exactly what counts. <laughs> I love it. I'll throw myself to the fire on that one. I, 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 I love it though. I love it. Coach Carter for the win. <laughs> I mean, it's. A, I like the movie. I didn't know if it would count. No, the movie is fire. You know what I'm saying? Like we used to run Delilah in 2K. <laughs> All right, we'll see y'all tomorrow on the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show. Peace.